We have a lot of talks today, uh, very short talks actually, because we wanted to fit in as much as possible from all the applications. Hopefully next year we get the full day again, which would be great. Um, so we've got different topics like graph streaming, graph analytics, graph burying, uh, so all things graph, which is cool. And um, yeah, with that, I want to introduce our first speaker, uh, Vincent from Intel, who will talk about scalable cross-platform graph analytics. So my name is uh, Vincent Keller at Intel on Hive, which uh, is not an acronym for Scalable Cross-Platform Graph Analytics Framework in Python. And this is work we are doing conjointly with uh, Anaconda. Uh, so quick outline, uh, what is Hive, what is the architecture, the interfaces, how do you extend it, and a quick summary of it. So at its core, what we're trying to do with Hive is uh, to build a graph analytics API in Python for graph users. And because you're operating in Python, you probably want to do uh, um, integrate into that whole data science ecosystem, right? And um, the, inter the kind of interoperability we want to provide is that it's easy, for instance, if you have uh, containers like NumPy uh, arrays or data frames, you can uh, use them, convert them into graphs, right? So this sort of already exists uh, if you think of NetworkX. Uh, the issue with it is that it's pretty slow. So uh, one of the things we want to do is really uh, leverage all the, the fantastic high-performance uh, graph libraries that are out there, right? So that it's, uh, some people, it's the bread and butter, right? They do their research, they maintain it, they make it work. Uh, once you have these uh, APIs and then uh, a set of graph frameworks, uh, you need some kind of a glue, right? Something that can orchestrate how do you go from this uh, Python API down to actually calling into some implementations, right? And for this, we're going to use DASD, uh, which is developed by Python. Uh, we want this to be a community-driven effort, right? So there's a number of data science packages, there's a number of high-performance uh, graph libraries, and uh, we can't just tackle uh, everything by ourselves, right? So we want to give out the, uh, the frameworks, uh, the interfaces, and have people contribute to it. And finally, we want this to be hardware agnostic, so we want to be able to plug uh, as many uh, hardware vendors and hardware in there, uh, but do nothing in that architecture that would make it at your local uh, finally, this is uh, in, in development right now. Um, think of this as a kind of a teaser of things to come. And it's going to be open source in 2020, uh, you know, sometime uh, with like the zero dot something uh, to get feedback from the community. Uh, so let's start at the, the basics, right? So if you if you want to express uh, a graph algorithm, right, you're going to have to need data for graph representation. And you're going to express your graph algorithm using a paradigm, right? So think of this, for instance, uh, you can express a graph algorithm with linear algebra. You can use vertex-centric, uh, box synchronous kind of model where you have data from your neighbors, eccentric, all this. Right? So someone is going to provide you with an API and you follow that paradigm, and then you can implement your graph algorithm. And finally, uh, you get your data in the compute. Right now, you need the hardware architecture so that you can run it. Right? So all, these, all of these things are interrelated. So um, this is an example, just a list of graph frameworks, right? Uh, there are in no way associated with this effort. I just picked them because uh, you know, people doing great work, just to illustrate my point. So if I take, for instance, shoot sparse, right? Uh, I'm going to have uh, basically using a subset of this graph representation and a certain way of uh, expressing things to write my graph algorithm, and then uh, targeting a certain architecture, right? And um, this is basically just because you know people are focusing on something, and um, it's not a critique, I guess, what I mean. But uh, if I switch to Galois, then I might have a different set of things I'm going to use, and graph it, and so on, right? So, so now the question is, if I'm a data scientist, and I'm sitting in the Python ecosystem, and I want to leverage this, how do I do that, right? So if you have a Python interface with one of them, you can use it, but then you kind of are buying into a small ecosystem, right? You have to maybe format your data so that the graph algorithm can use them. And if you're building a workflow, maybe there's something in one of these frameworks that's not available in the other, and now you have to deal with how do I go from one to the other. So uh, this is where we think the, the Hive API would, uh, would contribute. So the goal is to have a high-level uh, set of graph APIs. So think of this like you want to do community <coughs> detection clustering, so you can use Google. Uh, you want to do some uh, graph pattern matching, so you have some graph isomorphism, this sort of thing. So very high level, so that if you're a data scientist, you can just take it off the shelf and use it. Uh, 
uh, one thing we want to explore is doing this kind of a graph study uh, APIs with Numba. So if you're not familiar with Numba, uh, it's basically allows you to write a function in Python, and you can annotate it, and then you can cheat it. <coughs> so one of the, the simple things we wanted to try to do, for instance, uh, if you want to do some kind of a filtering operation, uh, you stay in the Python side, you write this um, kind of a print page, and then you have the runtime go over of the edges of the, the vertices, apply that function, and you get a subset out. And uh, finally, we want to make the interoperability uh, easy with the data science ecosystem. So uh, think of this as how do I convert across containers? What are the most popular things uh, we can sort of support by default so that you, other people don't have to? So once you have these APIs, uh, you need a glue right, in between the APIs and the framework. So we're going to use uh, the Dask runtime. So think of this as uh, you do lazy, lazy evaluation on the APIs, and you dynamically build this task graph to the things you want to do. Right? And, and now you, you have the user express what he wants to do, and you also have uh, a bunch of uh, algorithm implementation that are by themselves. So you need a broker uh, to do the orchestration. Right? So this is both. I want to schedule the compute on resources, and also I want to uh, use runtime to handle all data movement. And finally, we want this to be uh, accessible via yeah, plugins, so that you can just uh, you know, sort of jump in and uh, have your own things. So let's have a look at the framework interfaces. So the centerpiece is this uh, high task uh, runtime, right? So it's going to be orchestration. Then you have the user API. So again, a uh, high level thing like Duluga on the graph. And the graph is kind of this opaque type uh, <coughs> abstract the data type. Right? It's just a graph. Then you can define uh, your data models, right? So for this abstract type, that's a graph, I want a concrete type, which is maybe I have a data frame that represents uh, an adjacency matrix, and it's stored in the CPU uh, memory subsystem. And I also have a CSR data type, right? Anything I can imagine. So then you're gonna define transformers, right? So how do I go from that data frame on the CPU to a CSR on the CPU, and so on. Right? So some of these, they can be uh, part of the common library, some of them, uh, just framework implementer can go and add them. And finally, you have the graph, the graph algorithm backend. So think of here, I'm saying I'm exposing Luga. It's uh, running on this x plus framework that I just made up. Running on CPU and taking a CSR input. Right. So <coughs> you think of building all of these, right? You actually just built a graph of uh, dependencies, right? So this user API, they have implementation as graph algorithm, they use some data model, <coughs> these edges between the models, they are the transformers. So Dask can now take this graph and reason about uh, what the user has expressed and what it can do. So it's really uh, you know, doing graph analytics with the help of graphs. So on the, the left hand side, you can see a workflow of a task graph. So here I start uh, outside of the hive ecosystem, right, loading data, pre-processing, whatever is your workflow. And then once you cross in, right, you can say, I want to create a graph, I want to apply an operation, and so on. So if you think about that graph we had before, dependencies, right, here I might have a, a data frame coming in here, right, so the system knows, okay, I have a data frame uh, data model, and what do I need to convert it into? Well, it depends what the, what is the set of graph operation implementation that I have. Right, so <coughs> you're solving this, and you come up with uh, basically a schedule. And uh, finally, when you, uh, you know, at some point you just exit that and go back to your regular uh, work. Uh, another cool thing here is the data transformation. So just by um, you know, trans transitivity, uh, you might actually support some stuff that you haven't provisioned for. So here, for instance, I start in the file format. I know how to make it a table. I know how to make it a second graph format into a last one. Um, so it would probably run horribly, but uh, what I found pretty cool about this is that now you can think about building some uh, government monitoring infrastructure, right? So in Dask, you could have uh, look at this graph and kind of figure out, oh, you know, you keep doing this path that is very long and expensive. So the system could tell you, hey, if you actually implement a conversion directly from that file format to that graph format, then you're saving time. Uh, same thing on the, on the task graph, you could think of, um, for, for different graph inputs, you could try and characterize them 
right? And you could see when you run on CPU, when you run on GPU with these different inputs, this is the result you have, right? So you, you could plug all of this into some uh, machine learning framework and basically you learn from that. Uh, so in terms of the extensibility, uh, this is how you would support new hardware. So, so as you see, there's no functional changes to the user API, right? So you basically, uh, the only thing you might do is just maybe uh, add annotations to say, I really want to use that, that new backend that you've provided, but you don't change your code, so it's transparent for the user, mostly. And then you only need to implement these plugins, right? So I need to go and describe the data model for the CS sound that XPU I made up, a lot of transformers, again, and finally, uh, my implementation. So, so here, this is an example where I use a framework and I just extend it, but um, what, I find, what I find pretty interesting is that you could just take any code off the shelf from the internet that's using Pfred or whatever, you wrap it in that uh, Python interface, <coughs> and then you have it advertised in a framework, <coughs> and it's, it's, it's a great way to basically leverage what's out there. And once you've done that, then it's part of the high runtime toolbox that makes uh, this uh, graph we've seen uh, larger, and then uh, you can use it. So one thing that's pretty cool also is that that allows you to mix uh, hardware architecture, right? So you can uh, start your, if you have different graph operation, maybe you do one on the CPU, the next one on the GPU. Uh, it's also a great way to get portability, right? So if today I'm running on a box and it has a GPU and I'm using the GPU algorithm, but tomorrow I'm not, as long as I have an implementation that cover, let's say the CPU, uh, my code would still run. Uh, so in terms of the extensibility for the, if you want a new user API, then the same thing, you just have a subset of uh, plugins you need to work with. So the user API, uh, so here I'm um, extending it as a, let's say I want to triangle counting on a graph, and then I just have to provide uh, you know, at least one implementation. So here I'm still using my Splash example. And then again, it's just going to be part of the, uh, of the API, uh, what, uh, of the runtime toolbox, right? So we run this basically so that people can just you know, plug in new algorithm and leverage all the work that's been done on the, on the backend. So as a sort of a summary for the, the stakeholders view, if you're a data scientist, what you gain is that you have now unified APIs for graph analytics. You have the Python interoperability that allows you to basically plug your work into a larger workflow. And basically, you just have this state-of-the-art backend that are always available, right? They are maintained, they are optimized. You get the transparent orchestration so that you don't have to worry about uh, what is the actual underlying hardware you have. And you get the increased uh, workflow portability. <coughs> if you're a graph framework developer, um, you we hope this would help sort of structure a way of this is how I present a graph algorithm uh, in a Python form, in Python form. Uh, so hopefully this would sort of bring um, the community together. Uh, it's an increased user base, right? So now, uh, because it's much easier to, to plug in your framework into uh, that larger hive ecosystem, uh, hopefully that will grow your user base. And what I really hope we can do is you know, some way to, to provide performance feedback for, for the people who are developing this, right? So that you know, by logging and, uh, and sharing those data. And finally, if you're a researcher, I guess in the, in the grand scheme of things, uh, we want it to be easy to integrate in your workflows, right, across the, the Python ecosystem, and uh, be easily extensible so that people can do research, either you know, at the orchestration level or the, the, the data model, uh, or the frameworks, and basically have this performance monitoring and optimization uh, to improve the so uh, yeah, that was my presentation about Hive, operates between graphs and data science, and I will take any questions. Somewhere where optimization, not to 
think it's um, you can definitely do that. I think part of the work would be also to uh, either instrument so that you kind of learn what is the performance characteristic of running something, right? So that because uh, then when you have this data, you can you can make decisions, right? So it could be very well that in some cases, even though you ship data back and forth, your your accelerator is so much faster that it makes sense. And in some cases, it might not. So if you have the data, then you can. Yeah, I think at the task level, basically, whatever is the uh, the orchestration plugin, that's why you plug in heuristics right, of how you should. And, you know, most likely this would be also policies that you can just inject. So for some reason, depending on what you want to do, you say favor this and that approach. Uh, one of the sort of conditions that we had was uh, you, you could be able to have any hardware and then. Uh, run an algorithm on the CPU and then another one on the GPU. Uh, who, who do you expect in that scenario to handle that data movement going from the CPU to the GPU? Oh, yeah. So, so the question is, uh, yeah. so who do you expect would be doing uh, basically the, the data movement between CPUs and GPUs? Uh, so yeah, I think it goes a little bit into how we this effort would fit in the ecosystem because uh, some frameworks, right, you have one entry point and then it kind of decides that they're only risky to say, do I do CPUs or GPUs? So I think what we would need, ideally what we want is, uh, as we build that task uh, graph, uh, we would like that to have the control, basically, to have the most, the most um, flexibility possible. And for that, you kind of have to open up a little bit the, the, these frameworks to say, it's not just that I'm doing Luda on a graph, I'm <coughs> doing Luda on a GPU or Luda on a CPU. <coughs> and at that point, then in that, uh, these data transformers, because it goes back to that question, right? Then you have the whole picture and you can say, okay, it would cost that much to do the transfer. <coughs> and you can actually do something about it because it's not baked in the framework. Um, so, uh, yeah, so then you have these data transformers that would basically